Hello everyone and welcome to you all to yet another very exciting uh, presentation. Um, yeah, welcome to the biggest congress uh, this year and uh, yet the A4Q World Congress which has started today and will go on until Friday and we have a um, lot that is coming up for the next couple of days. So um, today I'm very proud to introduce to you Christian Alexander Graf. The name stands for Quality Assurance and Statistics. And as a passionate mathematician and quality insurance expert, Christian will talk about the need to know on cybersecurity today. So I'm very excited. So let me get him in here. Hello, Christian. Hello, very Chris. Nice to you. Hello, Chris. Thank you for the very nice introduction. And uh, welcome to my talk, which is about the need to know on cybersecurity. And um, so, first, let's start with a simple definition what actually is cybersecurity? Well, <clears throat> cybersecurity is often defined via the so called security triangle, um, consisting of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And when it comes to security, that usually means that we want to protect something. And usually, within the context of cybersecurity, this is either personal, uh, personal information, company information, or services, or even hardware that we want to protect, which is run by computer programs and can therefore be destroyed by computer programs. And um, confidentiality means in the context of cybersecurity, we don't want anybody to read something which he shouldn't have access to. So that's basically confidentiality. So access to information should only be given to authorized identity, uh, entities. Then integrity means that we can't compromise the system in a way that we can, for example, this, um, yeah, that we can do things that we shouldn't be able to do. For example, access processes or services that we shouldn't be able um, to access or change something like log entries or change, for example, user data or any other data. And finally, availability is that we can use services as actually an authorized user whenever we really need the services. And if somebody can disrupt the services in a way that they are not available anymore, usually called, called a denial of service uh, attack, um, then, well, availability is in jeopardy and that's what we don't want to have. Um, Let's take a look at two examples, what can happen with, uh, within the system. I took older examples because in the good old days, it was rather simple to hack into systems. Um, uh, but even nowadays, it can be shockingly simple to get into some systems. And that's actually what you want to prevent. And I'm going to show you in the talk what you should know about cybersecurity when you want to build secure systems. So let's first Take the first example, the so-called heartbeat plug, uh, bug, which was actually a TSL protocol, um, which established secure um, information exchange between, for example, a client and a server or two servers. And um, one service or actually one functionality within the TLS protocol is um, a keep alive service. So it's the heartbeat message, which basically enables you to check from a client if you still have a connection to the server, to the, uh, to the SSL uh, server. And, um, uh, and it works basically in the way that you send a message to the server with an arbitrary text or some text that you of your choice, like for example, X, Y, Z. And you also tell the server the length of the message that you're going to, set, to, to um, send. Then the TLS server just mirrors this message back to you with the content that you send to the server, like for example, X, Y, Z. Now, that's the idea. And now in, 2013, uh, in 2014, um, a developer introduced, unfortunately a German developer, introduced by mistake a bug. Um, so, uh, when copying actually this message, X, Y, Z, back to the output buffer to send back to the client that was sending the heartbeat message to check if so there was a connection available, um, the length of the actual buffer was not checked. It was just supposed that this length that actually the sender was giving 
was accurate without checking if he really sent uh, a message with with this given length. So what an attacker now could do was the following. We have our attacker, our black hat evil guy. And uh, what the attacker now could do was to tell actually the server, I want to know if our connection is still alive. So I'm sending you a heartbeat message with a length of 100. And what he then did, in fact, was just not to place um, actually 100 um, characters. is symbolic, yeah, could be much longer, the message that he sent. Um, not only 100 characters, and he just put only three characters in. Um, what the server then did, to put, he copied in the output buffer the first three characters that the attacker sent, and everything else in the memory up to the length of the buffer that the attacker actually defined. And in that memory, one could, port, for example, read email addresses, passwords, and so on, keys, encryption keys, and so on. So everything that was just in the memory, just behind actually this short text that the attacker gave was just copied and sent back to the attacker. And now actually the idea of the, of the Heartbleed attack was actually to access as many servers that had this vulnerability and uh, then to save through the messages that came back uh, for interesting content. Yeah. That was basically the heartbleed attack. And if we are going back to the security triangle, that's actually here uh, a loss of confidentiality and actually a total loss of conf confidentiality. So the second example I want to give you is even older. It's from the year 2000. And um, we had here a so-called uh, SCADA system. And um, SCADA actually st stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition Systems. And it's usually used quite often in the industry to control, for example, um, production plants or um, water sewage systems, pipelines, and so on. So these are really, really important systems, and they were originally not built with security in mind. Um, actually, we have a similar problem with Internet of Things. So actually, Internet of Things is, uh, one could say, um, if you have a smart home, it's a SCADA system in, um, on small scale, if you want. And um, here was a disgruntled employee um, who was fired from the company um, that actually had, uh, had placed a lot of huge uh, pumps and systems um, within the area of, of uh, Marucci in, uh, in Australia, in the Marucci Shire Council in Queensland. And um, he spoofed communications from pumping stations using a radio device and a laptop. Um, and so actually um, told pump systems to work backwards and to regurgitate um, wastewater into the landscape, including the grounds of a high Regency hotel. Um, actually, it was about 80,000 gallons that were running all across uh, the, the Shire side. And it, really, it, it was really a, a heavy uh, environmental damage uh, that he caused him. Well, um, he was finally caught by a cyber specialist from, from the police, from Australian police, um, and uh, went to jail. Please don't ask me how long he went to jail. If, if you want to know how long that was, you can read it up in the, uh, in the sources that I gave you. And here we have actually uh, not only a loss of con uh, confidentiality, but what we here have in this case is actually an integrity breach because he could actually access the pumps with his special knowledge about the system, so it internal knowledge. And um, he also um, so caused actually denial of service because the system was not anymore working properly and putting away with the waste waste water. It was working the other way around. So not very nice. There can happen really nasty things if uh, cybersecurity is breached. And um, now, if you are developing such systems, it's very important for you to know how to prevent this. So I'm not talking now for how to hack systems, but uh, I'm talking now about what do you need to know if you want to build secure systems, be it um, industrial control systems, be it automotive systems, be it secure medical device systems, or be it secure smart homes or mobile applications, whatever you like. So what do you need to know? The first thing you need to know and you need to think about is you need to know your assets. So what is really important to protect in the system that you're building? Is this information? Is this services? Is this personally identifiable information? Um, is this maybe hardware? Yeah, like for example, the pumping stations you want to protect. 
yeah. um, or production um, capacities that could be destroyed if somebody can control them and uh, give commands in a way that will, for example, destroy an engine or an oven or yeah, pumping station too. Um, then you should think about which assets I want to protect, but who might want to attack the, atta or the, the assets. So you need to think about your attackers. Against whom do you need to protect your system? Then you need to know about what could cause a potential entry gate for an attacker. Now, what are weaknesses? What are typical things that will put a weak spot, weak spot in your system? Weak spot could be fine, but as soon as somebody can access it, it's a vulnerability. So you need to know about typical vulnerabilities that uh, attackers will look for. So, and then in the end, if you know how weaknesses work, how vulnerabilities work, you need to know how attacks work. So you need a basic knowledge of that, how principal attack types are done. The next thing you know is how to put that knowledge into a process. So you need to know about how to establish security requirements and security uh, process. Then how to fulfill your requirements in terms of a secure design of your system, how to implement then the software securely, which is again on the next stage. And then again, you need constantly to review and test your system of potential other weaknesses or especially vulnerabilities that you might introduce during the process. So will that work? Will that be enough? So basically, security um, development is basically a risk-based approach. So you need an appropriate process for that. And this is the process I'm uh, showing you here. So first thing that I already told you is you need to identify goals protection goals. What do you want to protect? And for that, you need to know, as I said, where are actually your assets, like services, like data, like machinery, like processes, like knowledge, and who would like to steal it, destroy it, or yeah, um, play, with it, play with it around. Then where could an attacker get at um, your valuable things. Yeah, that's actually, and that's that's actually the the, per, the point of entry where an attack could be staged. Uh, that's, that is also called an attack surface. We will go a little bit later into that a little bit more, give you another overview on that. And if you know what are your assets, potential attackers, and potential entry gates, then you can think about okay, what are the vulnerabilities in these potential entry gates, or what could be vulnerabilities in the entry gates, because maybe I haven't built yet the system. So I'm in development, I'm in uh, requirements engineering phase still. So what do I need to do that nobody that shouldn't be able to enter can enter here? And once you identified potential threats and vulnerabilities, you can define and take action. And the next point is you need to, to validate these actions. And then we are again with review and testing. So, and you see that's actually uh, a repeating process um, that you should do within all the life cycle. We will come later to that and I'll show you an overview uh, which life cycle phases you have. And actually you always need to repeat this process here. It's, it's a little bit like, uh, like the Deming cycle, yeah? only adapted for security. Again, to make it more clearly, what's actually the dependence between weakness, vulnerability, and then finally actually uh, an attack. Um, first of all, um, a, a weakness is um, actually uh, something that is not really good or really working or which 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 could lead actually to a vulnerability. It's not yet a vulnerability, but it's, it's some fold in the code. Uh, maybe some bug in the code, some defect um, that could be used by an attacker if and only if he has access to that weakness. So, for example, something like a true message length is not checked when copying memory content into a message buffer. That's first a weakness. But as soon as an attacker can control the input through that message, like, for example, the message length, the thing becomes a vulnerability. So. A programming bug or a design fold um, plus access by somebody, that's a vulnerability. 
the design fault or the programming mistake in itself is a weakness. But with, ex with access, it becomes a vulnerability. And then an attack is po possible, like we've seen in the uh, uh, hard plate bug. We can read arbitrary server or server memory content in the end because this is really a vulnerability because a potential uh, attacker has access. So, where does he have access to? We need to understand too, and this is the attack surface. And uh, attack surface can be easily defined as the sum of all functionality and code that can be accessed by users and potential attackers. If you are developing software or systems, you need a proper process and proper tools to identify attack surfaces, and you need techniques and mechanisms to reduce the attack surfaces. Now, that's a very important point in developing secure systems. Understand attack surfaces and then reduce them continuously. And um, yeah, attack surfaces, also I need to know what do I want to get at? Where's the attack surface? Is this a human factor? It can be a human factor too. It can be, yeah, the software in itself. If there are bugs in it, I can use it who has access to code. Or is there a way to manipulate code by injecting something? Yeah, that's, uh, that's an important point. Or um, can I circumvent authorization mechanisms? Yeah. Um, So now we need to know yeah, how to establish security requirements. And one thing that can help is actually an attack surface analysis. Um, usually the process should, should start very early when I'm building the, the system in the beginning. And one possible method to establish re security requirements is to start very at the top. If I only have use cases, I still don't have or I'm, do not necessarily have already an idea how to implement that when I start with requirements. I just might have some idea what, what the system is going to do. And here we have an example um, for how misuses, um, misuse cases basically work. Um, we start with a use case, like, for example, we have a Corona app that should support a restaurant owner and uh, the health authorities when people want to visit a restaurant and um, actually to find out if um, an infection could have happened um, in the restaurant and then to trace people who have visited the same restaurant. So somehow we need to document a visit, for example, by reading a barcode that belongs to the restaurant and um, maybe reading the barcode twice when coming, when going, so that uh, within the app, um, coming and leaving is actually documented. Or maybe we will do this via Bluetooth or something like that, but, but in, uh, in some way we, we need to do this. Um, we need also maybe uh, something that enables us uh, to report if a restaurant visitor has unfortunately caught an infection and uh, reports this to the public health department um, that maybe the public health department has then actually as, uh, access to information to uh, which places uh, that person uh, visited. And maybe also the app should enable um, the restaurant visitor to document private meetings so that he knows, okay, whom, uh, whom have I met within the last five days so that I can actually um, inform those people that they might have caught an infection that they should get themselves tested. So um, now we have here a, now we have here the evil guy, and like in use cases, um, we don't have here now a user, but we have here a misactor, and misactors can be of different types. It can, could be a malicious restaurant visitor, and here we have a malicious competitor, a competitor of the restaurant owner, and what he like to do is actually. Um, he wants to force closing of the rest uh, restaurant by misreporting um, to the to the public health department so that they maybe close down the place of the restaurant owner because um, they think that too many people got infected. So he would try then in that case actually to to misuse the use case document visit and report a test result in some way. And um, so at this stage, um, we know we need requirements and we need to think in the design of our system um, that we need mecha mechanisms that prevent a misuse in this way. And that's actually what uh, misuse cases are about. We start with the use case, then we th start to think about which types of misvectors do we have, what would they like to do with the system or how would they like to compromise the system to what end, and then we take a look at which use cases could they try actually um, 
to um, misuse, yeah, to, to yeah, to um, incorporate in their malicious schemes. That's uh, that's the idea of misuse cases. And now we are very early in the process. Now we can think about ideas. Um, what should we implement additionally as um, protection mechanisms in uh, in our system? And uh, for that end, here actually. Um, the way threat modeling works together with requirements engineering is based here. And we have placed an activity which is actually called threat analysis because it goes further than threat modeling. We'll see that later in the light in the life cycle. At the beginning of uh, building a product, I will do actually threat modeling. Later, when I've built already parts of the product, um, then I do additional threat analysis to see if there are in the way of built a product up to a certain point, now new threats arises or new vulnerabilities occur, uh, which I have to deal with. And threat analysis and specifically at the beginning threat modeling um, begins actually with, um, um, gives actually things about which requirements are at risk and what kind of measures do I need to take uh, in order to prevent certain attacks, to reduce attack surfaces, and so on. Um, so threat analysis helps us to define adequate measures in design, implementation, and configuration yeah, with by identifying security requirements and um, defining activities and also doing threat analysis tells us, us also, are there some requirements when we start to define activities um, that, for example, um, we can't catch in the software? Like, for example, the human factor when using the software. Like, for example, social engineering. Yeah, if the problem is in front of the, of the desktop or uh, the app, um, well, there's only so much you can do. So some requirements will be, OK, um, this has to go into a user guide how to apply the system safely and securely, especially in our context, securely. So and actually, um, this threat modeling cycle was suggested by Adam Shostak, who wrote really a very nice book about threat modeling. It's really recommended reading. I like it very much um, when working, especially for Microsoft and setting up there um, or helping there to improve um, the secure um, software development lifecycle. Now, next point is we need to design our systems in a secure manner. And to that end, we should know some design principles. There are loads of them. And in the A4Q Security Essentials course, you will learn the most important ones. And basically, what is a design principle? Actually, it's a guiding principle that serves as a guide to avoid typical errors and weaknesses in the design of a system. Um, speaking in non-technical -techn terms, if you run around with open shoelaces, um, you run the risk of falling on your nose. So um, to implement a design principle, you need design patterns. And that's a general re reusable solution um, approach to, to solve the problem that was given by a design principle. So what do we do if we don't want no loose shoelaces? Well, we could tie our shoes. That's the first possibility we have. That's a design pattern. But there's another design pattern with which we can solve that problem, and that's using shoes with no laces. Well, if the shoes look like this, yeah, um, I still could stumble and fall easily. So maybe I use some other type of shoes with that. So here you can see that's why we go on with actually a security life cycle. Um, that is, if we've suggested a solution, then to analyze again, what are actually the security risks that we have here? Same you can do with safety. Actually, that's your more safety test um, uh, risk than the security risk. But, um, Basically, the process in, processes in safety and security are quite similar. Then we need to implement security things. If we have found a proper design, we now need to implement design in the right way, in the right manner. And uh, with that, we can do a lot of programming mistakes. Um, and therefore, Dimitri, which is an, uh, a nonprofit organization which collects such, uh, such things, um, they actually invented a, a common vulnerability um, enumeration. And they also have a weak common weakness enumeration with loads of things that can go wrong during programming. Um, worthwhile, a look to take into, uh, worthwhile to take a look into. And um, well, uh, things that you should establish is you should know what are typical weaknesses in programs and you should set up coding standards within your company um, which prevent insecure programming methods. Uh, let's stick with um, the um, uh, with the heartbleed bug. 
For example, one design principle that we could do against such an overflow, and in, in, in this case, a, a read overflow, um, we could validate the input yeah, if it's according to specifications. And uh, one design pattern for input validation is, for example, to blacklist uh, inputs that are not allowed, like, for example, too long input. And a programming rule that supports that is, for example, to do to to use certain not to use certain programming constructs that that uh, would allow such a vulnerability to happen, like, for example, the gets in a command in the C language. So that's actually basically what programming rules are about. And to um, uh, to to flag that, um, we actually need to support that. We also need again reviews. And uh, we need also um, static analysis in testing, which helps that to a great deal. So now we come to the testing stage. Um, first of all, security testing is a very, very, very broad subject. So you need actually own trainings in this area that specialize in security testings, like, for example, how to perform security audits. That can be the organizations like the ISO, 27001, which is actually about how to set up an uh, this, yeah, IT security risk management system. And uh, then you can analyze concepts. Are the concepts that you use in your organization um, valid and yeah, actually enough um, to fulfill the organizational needs? Uh, the next thing is that you really go deeper into the uh, IT systems and check with uh, vulnerability assessments and vulnerability th uh, scans uh, if actually the concepts have been implemented in a proper way or are there configuration mistakes, are there rules um, not checked or uh, not applied and things like that. Then um, you can go one step further and really try to break into the systems. Not only take a look where could be not only find potential vulnerabilities, but you really try to behave like an attacker. Do really proof of concept. Can I get into the system? And that's then the so-called penetration test. Um, and of course, now back to our topic, test during development. And that means that you do statics tests, fast testing, where you use random values to um, to get to any input export, uh, to any input device or any input uh, attack surface. And you can also do in later phases real penetration tests, where you um, use uh, higher specialists that really try to break into the system, even if it's securely configured, uh, to find where are the real vulnerabilities still. And most important, you need to establish this within a life cycle. And such a life cycle always starts with training. And oh, we have to see in German, we'll translate. This is the requirements phase. This is the design phase. This is the implementation phase. Here we have a verification phase. And then we have release and response. And our threat modeling we rather do at the beginning, during the requirements phase and the design phase. And um, during implementation, verification and release phase, we do actually testing and of course the implementation. So here we apply threat models and um, decide which design principles we need to implement. Here we decide on design patterns that we are going to use to implement design principles and which programming rules to apply. And we check that the programming rules are applied. We also test on different stages, including penetration tests um, when we are near or ready for the release. And what we also need to establish is a response phase that enables us to react when reports come from the field that uh, security has been breached. Or if we discover ourselves in the company during further, further tests, maybe for the next release, that security is at risk and that we need to patch the software, which is already in the market. So response is an important topic here. And that means that we always need to do during the whole life cycle to analyze for threats that we might have overlooked in early stages or to start to think about threats as early as possible with threat modeling and later on to analyze threats um, using the information that we collect during testing and further development of the system. So that's our lifecycle approach. And 
if you choose to check in with an A4Q security essentials course, okay, that was the advertisement block, um, what do you learn? You learn how to identify assets. You learn about different types of attackers. You know examples or you learn examples for weaknesses and weakness, typical weakness patterns. You come to know typical vulnerability patterns, especially typical attack surfaces. You come to know most, the most important types of attacks, so how basically attacks work. And you learn different methods, like, for example, misuse case, um, the stride method, um, or, for example, working with data flow diagrams to learn at different stages of system development and uh, system requirements engineering um, how to establish security requirements and how to spot potential vulnerabilities. You know the most important concepts of secure design and secure implementation. And finally, you get an overview on what methods you can apply in security testing. We don't go very deep into the methods. You don't learn uh, security testing in this course, but the basics so that you can go on and specialize then, for example, in security testing or in secure programming later on, even stronger. So that's what the course is about. And yeah, um, that's where I'm finished and I'm now open for questions. Thank you so much, Christian. Um, I think this is a very, very interesting, interesting topic uh, due to the growing demand of, of AI and um, online services. I think uh, cybersecurity is a very, very interesting topic um, that everybody should really follow up on. Um, I do have a question from Marie. Hold on. Would you encourage small businesses um, for example, startups to hire cybersecurity experts or to de delegate related matters to specialized companies? Um, that depends on the company you're running. Um, so if you, uh, for example, a baker's shop um, doesn't have to do much with the internet, um, I don't think that makes much sense. But if you have a web shop, um, it's probably a good idea um, to uh, ask a company. There are, there are companies, for example, offering services like intrusion detection for small companies um, that they monitor actually what you are doing. So it really dep depends on what your assets are. So that's that's my recommendation. I hope that helps. Okay. Yeah. This is uh, the only question I have here. Well, thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, like I said, uh, I think it's a very, very interesting topic. Uh, it reminds me a bit of um, one of my favorite books from Mark Ellsberg, um, Blackout. I don't know if you heard of it. Um, yeah. Where it actually goes in, in the same direction. What happens if you cut off the power for the whole world and um, what actually is, is behind it and uh, what happens after. So I think, um, yeah, everybody should um, stick to to the cybersecurity, and especially when it comes to to home devices and services, it's very important to um, be on the safe side there. Mm -hmm. So, I can't see any other questions here. Um, I guess that's it. Thank you so much for your presentation, Christian. Yep. Yeah, thank you very much. And for all of you, um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the A4Q Congress, and I will see you in the next presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. See ya. Bye-bye. Yeah, are we seeing backstage? Yeah. Good. <laughs>